。但是那我们准时两点正开始哦。嗯。Okay, ladies and gen,、uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start very soon. Okay, hi everyone. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Dato Dato, doctor and、uh, delegates, is a beautiful Friday. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us here、uh, online. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Pan. Uh, sincerely, thank you for giving us a chance to have this、uh, online seminar. Consider this the first Malaysia Parabasis Anti-Aging、uh, Tech Podcast. Having here with us today, we have、uh, doctors, practitioners, and delegates from、uh, across Malaysia, of course, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and some of them might be、uh, joining us from、uh, London and San Francisco. Thank you again for joining us here, and I hope you all are doing well. <clears throat> so,、uh, it's probably Very little of our audience today is、uh, know about Dr. Pan. Dr. Pan is a、uh, Dr. Pan actually started his、uh, research life、uh, in a very early age, as his、uh, late father was a very prominent scientist in Taiwan, and also a professor from、uh, University of Kyoto, Japan. Therefore, Dr. Pan has been、uh, introduced into a lab at very young age. Dr. Pan received his education in NTU, National Taiwan University, and、uh, later advanced abroad into University of Chicago. There, he firstly received his PhD in chemistry and then also the medical degree, both in the University of Chicago. During his practice in the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Dr. Penn was given the seed grant to establish the anti-aging medical program for the very first time in back in the 1990s. Dr. Penn is the first Asian plastic surgeon which is certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. And currently hold the position of a chief secretary in Taiwan Association of Anti-Aging Medicine. His expertise lies in the biochemistry, biophysics, mathematics, and biotechnologies. Dr. Pan is also the chief technology officer in Lotus Biotechnology Private Limited, exploring the human anti-aging modalities. So I must say I'm very lucky and honored today to have the chance to host this wonderful webinar. Where Dr. Pan is going to、uh, share his、uh, research and、uh, clinical works in heterochronic parabasis,、uh, a very wonderful topic related to、uh, aging reversal and the clinical clinical approaches to treat age-related chronic disease. So let's do no further. I welcome our excellent speaker today. Welcome, Dr. Pan. Hello. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm sure. I'm assuming what I'm talking about. I'm assuming you, everybody is online now and and ready, getting ready to、uh, participate in this talk. Okay. And first of all, I want to thank Mr. Lu to give me the chance、uh, to have the opportunity to、uh, to share our experience in、uh, anti aging. Uh, for the past thirty years, with you online, okay, and I understand most of the physicians online today are from Malaysia, and as I always say, you know, I I have a spot in my heart、uh, which belongs to Malaysia because about ten fifteen years ago, I already have a have the chance to set up a、uh, ADSC adipose stem cell company in、uh, Penang. So、uh, every time when I get a chance to speak、uh, with people from Malaysia, I feel very、uh, happy about it. Okay, so I'm going to、uh, get into my talk、uh, without uh, uh, right now. So the topics of my talk is、uh, the science of aging reversal. Okay, so this is not going to be a very、uh, heavy medical talk, and I'm not going to give you a lot of jargons about medical terminology and this and that. But instead, 
I'm hoping to give you uh, another viewpoint about uh, looking at the anti-aging problem and uh, also as a physician, uh, how can we uh, utilize the science uh, of aging reversal in and to incorporate them into our practice, okay? As Mr. Lu addressed, my background is kind of weird because uh, I'm not a, I, my father was a medical doctor, but he is also a medical researcher. So I began to my uh, laboratory uh, work when I was uh, seven years old. And I published my first paper when I was 14 years old. But, but uh, contrary to what most people will expect, I didn't go to medical school in college because I don't want to run into my dad in the campus of National Taiwan U and, you know, and he will tell me uh, do this and do that. So instead I decided to go into chemistry. And after chemistry, I, got my, my, I went to University of Chicago. And the reason I go to University of Chicago is because my father go to University of Tokyo, Kyoto in Japan. So I got to go to somewhere other than Japan. So that's, that's how it started. So I went to University of Chicago and the, I got my PhD in uh, physical chemistry. And after that, you know, when I get getting old, you, know, you feel like you know, maybe your father is right. So I decided to get into uh, medicine. So in, in, at the end, and I, I actually followed uh, the path he expected me to do. So, and as Mr. Lu addressed that I was a, I'm, I am a, a plastic surgeon and my, by definition, and, it's a craniofacial surgeon. So I'm, I started my early clinical works uh, in CHOPS, uh, Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, that's uh, how, how we started uh, all the stem, stem cell and uh, uh, other research works on this. And I also, uh, this is my disclosure, and uh, like, like uh, Mr. Lu said, I established several companies in uh, Asia, and which including the, the one in, uh, uh, Malaysia, and I also have a company in uh, Cambodia, and which we will also talk about it uh, in the later of the talk. So my talk, I expect to give it, uh, to finish in about 75 minutes, okay? And I organize my talk into uh, six parts. And the first part is I give you my point of view about aging, the, then I will follow with uh, a, a discussion about the uh, history of heterochronic parabolas, which is the fundamental experimental model based on uh, for our talk. And after that, I will tell you what, what has been developed regarding the clinical application of this experimental technology, which is called, uh, which is the pairing of old and young animals together. And after that, I will tell you, begin to tell you our experience in developing uh, the current uh, procedure of uh, ap applying heterochronic parabiosis into clinic practice. And I'll show you some of the clinical results and, uh, and, and uh, finish the talk with a discussion about the potential developments and the opportunities of uh, all the doctors which is interested in regenerative medicine and the or anti-aging medicine and or cell therapy. So I will start my talk with this uh, interesting uh, diagram. And this is the, uh, the X axis is the age of the death uh, of the US population uh, by, uh, this is a uh, woman, okay? So the dash line is the uh, 1993 curve, or uh, we, we call it the uh, death of age curve. And the third line is the by at eight year of uh, 2014. Okay, so the there are about uh, 80 years difference in between. So you can see the increase on the average of the lifespan, contrary to what most people think, is really actually is really the decrease of the um, death resulted during the uh, birth, childbirth. Okay, so it's the very big decrease in the uh, mortality uh, because of the advance in uh, gynecology and the obstetrics uh, care. And the actual increase in the uh, lifespan is, uh, is actually not as 
because what me, most media says that right? they always say that you get you get uh, five years more lifespan or uh, every whatever years, but it's really not the case. Okay, and but the most interesting and I think it's the most important one is the maximum lifespan actually has not improved at all. So in other words, uh, during the uh, eighty years ago, the longest women will live in the States uh, is around age of uh, 110. And 80 years later, uh, 2014, and the maximum lifespan of the uh, woman in US is remains the same. Okay? So as a result, let us look at another uh, graph. This is from the uh, World Health Organization. And the picture shows the um, shows the, uh, the, the, the chronic disease uh, of, a, of every uh, aging bracket. As you can see here, that for most people who is uh, between over 60 years old, and they are going to have uh, two or three uh, medical disorders. For people getting to close to 80 years old, and you can see that 90% of them is going to have some one or more di different uh, diseases. So the two uh, graphs tell us one thing is that although we, we, are, we can live to age of 90, maybe 100, but after the year of uh, 65, we are actually living with a disease. Most of us is going to be living with a disease, including myself and you know, I have a uh, gout and I have a uh, hyperpressure, things like that. And this is uh, the case. And you can also look at the disease curve here. You can see that after age of uh, 65, most of disease, which includes uh, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, and uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, including the COVID-19, the mortality rate increases dramatically after age of 65. So all these tell us that in the past, the medical te technology is trying to extend the life. But since our maximum lifespan is not going to increase uh, dramatically, and it is not expected to increase dramatically over the past uh, 10, 20 years. So the, there is a paradigm shift of, me of medicine that instead of continue to increase the lifespan, we are hoping to live, increase the health span. So in other words, that we want people to live healthy uh, until the last minute and they can drop dead. And I think we, that's, that's probably the hope and the, uh, the goal of uh, the current med medicine. We also know there are many, many diseases which is associated with aging. And as many of you know, the um, baby boomers, uh, just become us age of 65 around at uh, around eight, uh, year 2000. So in the early uh, 21st century, a bunch of uh, scientists uh, begin to get aware of the uh, importance of aging and the aging related disease. They came up with an important uh, paper uh, address the hallmarks of aging. And there are a bunch of uh, technical terms, which includes uh, stem cell exhaustion, intracellular communication, the, the alteration of the in, intracellular co communication, genomic instability, telomere uh, shortening, and uh, et cetera, and et cetera. And uh, more recently, there is a lot of uh, is, uh, research addressing the cellular senescence. So in other words, um, we are coming up with a bunch of mechanisms, such including what I just uh, talked about which all are possible causes of the aging and the aging related disease. If we uh, do a more uh, detailed analysis of those mechanisms, you can find that uh, the all hallmarks of aging, you can classify them uh, like the following uh, slide. In other words, that the aging is actually there. Yeah, if you want to break them into uh, two categories, there will be genetic cause and the epigenetic cause. Then after that, then you're going to have uh, breathing, you're going to, when you breathe, you're going to create a bunch of uh, reactive oxygen uh, species. And then you have uh, 
the those are uh, hallmark of aging, which are uh, I just addressed. And uh, after all those uh, hallmarks of aging, they will eventually result in chronic inflammation and uh, tissue fibrosis. And when these two things begin to occur, people go, is going to get into um, uh, a disease state. But it seems uh, simple, but because of the dirty nature of the biology, this uh, is a statement by Judith Campisi, which is one of the people who wrote the uh, original paper on uh, hallmarks of aging. And she always says that the aging problem are so complicated, it's almost impossible to address it uh, in a scientific way. And what, what's even worse is that there are so many research being done about aging and uh, uh, aging related disease. However, the success rate of, the, of bringing a successful uh, laboratory ex experiment to clinical practice is only 8%, okay? In other words, uh, you can see a bunch of papers published in Nature and Science, and they are doing very good work. But uh, at the end of the day, only uh, less than one tenth of them can become uh, clinically uh, useful. So as a doctor who has been involved in uh, anti-aging medicine uh, very early in my career, so uh, I want to ask the first question, that is, is there anything more basic on aging you know, rather than talk about all those complicated issues, telomere, DNA, RNA, uh, regulations, RNA, and this and that? Oh. So, so like what I just said, when I was, was uh, that was back in 1994, when I was in uh, University of Pennsylvania, I was the uh, young lecturer, and I was giving the uh, mission of give a lecture to give a, to to be responsible for the anti aging medicine class. So I do a bunch of studies, and that, at that time, uh, the concept of aging is very simple. Basically, we only look at the aging with two type of causes. One is genetic, uh, and the, the other type is uh, epigenetic. The genetic cause is the is basically is, is like a program uh, of the, our cells. So you, what you say is what is it is uh, saying is that when you get older, and some people get older at age of fifty, and that was uh, programmed when you are born, and then some people can live to eighty, and since it's just like a genetic disease. And the epigenetic concept is uh, the opposite. That means that it's more like uh, environmentally uh, influences. You know? So that's a two type of, uh, two big uh, school of the, uh, about aging. So the question we need to ask is that, the, is aging due to programmed cellular aging or not? Because if it's aging, if aging is due to the uh, genetic reasons or programmed cellular aging, then it's very little we can do because we we are we are born with it and uh, at at this at this stage to the best of my knowledge, I'm trying to uh, change the gene profile of everybody. I think it's still pretty difficult. So if aging is due to programmed cellular aging, then there's very little we can do. So let me show you one uh, a couple uh, experiments about this. So this is a German group. What they do is that they take the bone marrow stem cells from different age group. So from the uh, young age, from the middle age, and from the old age. And they put the, these cells, the bone marrow MSC in the lab and trying to grow them. And you can see that the top one, which is, actu is actually from a, a man who is uh, 80 years old, okay? So in other words, uh, although the cost of this uh, BMSC is 80 years old, but the cell, it, his cell actually has the uh, best performance. So, and this is another study, which is about the um, studying the uh, cardiac stem cells of different age. And the results is uh, very similar. And I think this is good news because of this. So that, that means that uh, there are some factors uh, we, can, uh, we can do something about it. So, the answer of uh, whether aging is related to the cellular uh, programmed aging is no. 
or we can say aging is at least partly due to epigenetic factors. So, and as uh, Mr. Lu first uh, introduced me, hey, you probably know that I'm, I was trained as a physical chemist. So what, what, what uh, physical chemist does is that we study the physical phen phenomena um, related to different chemical reactions. So because of those uh, uh, epigenetic factors, then are governed by the law of thermodynamics. And we will, I will try to show you the relationship between thermodynamics and the aging. So there is the first law of thermodynamics. You don't need to know anything about it. The only thing about you need to know about it is our uh, first law is about the conservation of energy. So in the past, we used to think the metabolic rate of someone uh, slowly uh, to decreases uh, after age of uh, 20. Uh, but uh, a very important study published last year in Nature is showing that actually that was not the case. So basically the metabolic rate was uh, maximized uh, in age of uh, uh, 18 or 20. And after that, it began to decrease and enter a, a plateau. And it, it actually only decreases after age of 65. Or, so what it says that before the age of 65, basically, the metabolic rate of a human over any adult is stays uh, about the same. And after age of 65, the metabolic uh, rate begins to decrease. And the number of the chronic disease the, or the incidence of the chronic disease begin, actually begin to increase. And the coincidence of this is so, drama so dramatic that you have to, you cannot avoid uh, addressing the relationship between the decrease in metabolic rate and the chronic disease incidence. So let me show you a very uh, simple um, arithmetic uh, calculation. So all what that says is that when when you when somebody is age, at age or below sixty, the energy you take in and the en en energy you, you you expend it is about the same. So the net energy is zero. And when people uh, become more than 60 years old, the, if the food intake is the same, because the metabolic rate begin to decrease, so you're going to have a net uh, excess of energy. And it is those excess energy uh, has to do something because of the low thermodynamics. So those excess energy will cause these, all those uh, hallmarks of uh, aging. Okay? This is the uh, thermodynamic view of aging. So as a result, if we can stop intake, stop taking in so much calorie after age of 60, or begin to do exercise, that is to, to say is to increase spending more energies, then you uh, eliminate all the excess energies. So as a result, uh, uh, ent entrance to the whole mass of aging will be prohibited. So this is the uh, reason why a dieting and the exercise are always the king and queen of anti-aging. And nobody, this is probably the most uh, well-studied uh, uh, anti-aging methods. And if you look at the, uh, the ca causal relationship, you, will, you can also see that the exercise and diet actually is very effective in blocking all those uh, hallmarks of aging. However, if you want to uh, live a healthy life and um, by using diet and the uh, exercise, then you probably uh, ha have, can always uh, have so little food in your plate because you have to reduce about uh, 35% of the calorie intake in order for uh, fasting uh, to be effective. Or you have to keep on running uh, probably you know, three, four hours a day and in order to, uh, to live longer. And but everybody knows uh, diet and exercise are so hard. Even you can do it uh, for a short time, but it is very difficult to, to be persistent on this. And you can also see so many people 
uh, keep on doing diet and exercise for their whole life. And as a result, we can see, we, we must say that although uh, diet and exercising and exercise as an anti-aging means are scientifically sound, but are clinically very difficult. Although they are free, okay. So we must we ask ourselves: Is there any other way, other than diet and exercise, that we can uh, re we can slow down the aging or reverse the aging effectively? Fortunately, there's a, a technology which was uh, done in about uh, 150 years ago, and the original experiment about pyrobiosis that means uh, stitching two uh, rats together was done by a guy called Dr. Uh, Paul Bird. He's a French surgeon. And after that, uh, Carrell, uh, Dr. Alexis Carrell in my um, alma mater, University of Chicago, uh, he did a, a bunch of uh, experiment on transbiosis, okay? And by connecting an old and young animal together, that was uh, first done by uh, Dr. McKay in Cornell, and that was in uh, 1957, okay? So what is important about heterochronic biopsies is that to the best of my knowledge, I think it is still the only rapid and visible aging reversal uh, experiment uh, to date, okay? There are so many uh, cellular, cell culture experiments or uh, small animal experiments, and they, they talk about the anti-aging effect. But I think uh, either uh, the progress is so slow or the changes are so, so little, you need to do a lot of standing, uh, doing also a bunch of uh, studies on the pathway. Is it, is, I don't know of any other ways uh, other than heterochronic biopsies which can give you visible changes in the age of the animal within five days. And that's very fast, okay? So what happened in hydrochronic biopsies is that when you uh, stitch the uh, abdominal skin of two uh, mice together and they begin to share their blood. So uh, if we can do, do this in human, and then we don't have to do this talk. So what we have to do is just uh, uh, connect the skin of uh, our belly with a young boy, and that is all, okay? And, but most of people think that uh, uh, connecting two people is clinically impossible, but it, but it is really not the case. Uh, the first uh, exception is uh, the uh, conjoined uh, twins, okay? But this is because they are, at the same age, so it's, it's really not, they are just uh, parabiosis, and they are not uh, heterochronic parabiosis. And another example, good example is uh, uh, pregnancy. And pregnancy, the mother is, is, is uh, always older uh, than the uh, fetus. The fetus will, will be probably one year old, and the mother can be between say like uh, 18 to 38 years old, okay? So this is a heterochronic power basis by definition, but because the size of the older animal or the mother is much, much bigger than the size of the fetus. So this is, uh, we, can, we can call that pregnancy as a asymmetrical uh, heterochronic power basis. So, and people begin to study about this, uh, uh, the effect of the pregnancy on the mother. And the result is very uh, interesting because as on this curve, you can see that if mother has the last pregnancy at the age of 45, and he, he and she will be, the, opportunity, the probability that she will live to 80 is going to be 50% higher than the uh, other group of mother who has the last pregnancy at age 35. And the reason of this is because, because the, uh, the fetus is age of one. So when mother get pregnant at age of 45, the difference in age is much bigger as compared to when mother get pregnant at age of 35. So the advantage or beneficial effects of the uh, heterochronic biopsies will be more significant for the uh, uh, first group, which uh, has the last pregnancy of age 45. So the 
first and the most easy way to get effective uh, hydrochronic bypass is, is to get pregnant uh, at an old age, at the old age, okay? So how can we do it? But it's, most of us, uh, especially men, cannot do this, uh, cannot get pregnant. So how can we do it uh, when, when two animals is separate? So the intuitive uh, thought about this is that you, people begin to guess that the reason uh, people can get from be, uh, get older is because when people are young, you have a lot of young factors in the body. And these young factors slowly decreases. So when you get older and the, the young factors are very little, and this is most of people intuitively think. And the, if you want, if you believe in this, then in order to reverse the aging, all what you have to do is to increase the young factors in the older body. So if you can infuse young stuff into old people's blood or in the in, in the buttocks through IM injections or, or things like that, then you will be able to reverse the aging uh, to help the client back to a more useful state because you increase the young factors in their body. And this is uh, uh, what uh, doctors one century, 100 years ago thought, okay? The pioneer in this is the Dr. Alexis Corral, and who I talked to, I mentioned during the uh, earlier in the talk. And he, he was the Nobel Prize winner in the 1992. And he's a pioneer, not only in heterochronic biosis, but he's also a pioneer in cardiovascular uh, exo, uh, exocorporeal circulations and things like that. So what Dr. Carroll did is that is rather than doing stitching the, uh, the organ to a young animal, what he did is he put the like a chicken heart in a dish and just replace it with different uh, extracts from a uh, from a chicken embryo, and by doing this, he is he was able to kept a uh, chicken heart uh, viable and uh, functional uh, for almost uh, thirty five years. You know, this is the first experiment about uh, it extending the life or reversing the life of uh, uh, or extending the life or reversing the aging of a uh, uh, organ. Uh, in the in the lab, and after that, uh, this is a very famous doctor. I think most of people know about him. Uh, he is uh, Dr. Paul Nehans, and he he was inspired by the uh, Corral's uh, experiment. So in 1931, he established a clinic in Switzerland. Is is they then become the brand called uh, La Prairie, and the Pope, uh, the famous actress Elizabeth. Taylor and Charlie Chaplin and uh, Winston Churchill are all their patients. And because his patients are so powerful and famous, and Dr. Nihans was also uh, the first uh, established anti-aging doctor uh, in, uh, in the history. So another group of people in Japan, uh, 40 years later, and they adopted the same concept of Dr. Nierhans. So rather than taking the extras from the lamb, the, the uh, fetal, fetal lamb, Paul Nierhans, uh, uh, I, I forgot to say that the Paul Nierhans got the uh, tissue extras, the embryo tissue extra from the uh, Arpino uh, lamb. And the, the, in the Japanese uh, company begin to collect the uh, useful factors uh, from the placenta of human. And they established two companies, and one is called the neck, and the other one is called um, Mayerson. And right now, I think only the neck is still uh, in the market. And they have uh, uh, many doctors, uh, there are many uh, clinics in Japan who uh, inject uh, placenta extracts for uh, anti-aging patients uh, from all over uh, Asia. In the West, the same concept uh, begins later. Although the uh, history uh, or the uh, story about vampires was uh, as early as the 
uh, 100 or 200 years ago. So in the West, only in uh, 2014, a Stanford graduate called uh, Jesse Kaimazin, and he was a medical student and he was inspired by uh, uh, Steve Jobs. So he heard about the heterochronic pyrolysis uh, experiments. So he thought of a business model. And that is to uh, give money to the young college student and ask them to donate blood to the company. And, uh, and he then uh, uh, transfused the young blood uh, to the uh, blood type matched uh, rich uh, people in uh, Silicon Valley and the company called Ambrosia. And the company was very, very famous and uh, doing very well in a very short time. And the, the business was so good that the FDA uh, uh, immediately uh, get aware of this, uh, their practice and begin to issue uh, some warning on this. And the reason FDA warned about this is not because the procedure was illegal or, uh, or harmful. The reason the FDA warning about this is uh, issued a warning later is only saying that the ambrosia uh, uh, therapy was not proven to be effective. Uh, it didn't say it's not effective. It's just not, or what FDA is saying is that the, the ambrosia uh, treatment is lack of uh, clinical trials. So they are, have only very limited clinical data. At that time, I think this is probably uh, the one of the most important papers on heterochronic pyrolysis. That was published in 2016 and by a scientist in uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley, okay, Berkeley uh, University. So this couple is the uh, husband and wife uh, couple of scientists. All what they do is uh, they, they want to address the issue in, of uh, applying heterochronic paralysis to a clinical stage. So they want to they implement uh, experiments rather than connecting the two animals together. They try to uh, draw the blood from the old animal and inject it into the young animal and uh, vice versa. And all what they, this is what they do. So this is a young animal, this is an old animal. And they will take out some blood from the young animal and inject it, uh, take out something from the old animal and inject it into the young animal and take out some blood from the young animal and inject it into the old animal. So if you do the uh, simple calculation, you will be seeing a graph like this. So you have a young animal like this. Now you take out, a little bit of blood from the young animal. So the young animal, because they have so much young factors. So they are in their body, the young factor only reduced by a little bit. And for the old animal, because they have very little young factors, and if you inject the young factors into the old animal, the percentage of increase in young factors in the old animal will be much, much bigger. So original anticipation of the experimental result was that the old animal will grow much younger and the young animal will, will only get a little older. However, the experimental result was just uh, opposite. You know, it was that the young animal was become much older with only a little bit of the old blood getting infused into their body. So contradicted to most people's intuitions, they think that is to say that most people think that the young people has young stuff, which is good, and old people has, has little young stuff, so it become old. Rather than think that that is actually uh, old people has a lot of old stuff and young people has very little, little old stuff. And that's the reason, uh, in other words, that the aging substance is the dominant factors uh, rather than the useful substance Okay, that's the, it, uh, it's the dominant factors. So if we use uh, driving a car as an analogy, all what we are saying that this is like the brake and the gas pedal. So the old aging substance is like a brake and the young substance is like the gas. So in other words, if, if you if you have so much uh, brake on and no matter how much gas, you add it in, the car is not going to move. And that's basically the, the concept. 
So in short, then uh, the combo experiment told us a very, very important information. That is to say the aging uh, substance in the blood at least is uh, toxic uh, to the young animal. And the experiment was repeated uh, many times, even up to uh, this year, and pretty much established the concept that old blood uh, is more powerful uh, in aging uh, to inhibit the young, uh, young uh, substance. So the concept was picked up by, was uh, similar to what Dr. Dobry Kiprock, he's the first guy who was board certified in plasma fluoresis in the States. So he was aware of the heterochromic pyrobiosis uh, experiment. So he, back in uh, 2013, he already began to think of applying a plasma exchange machine and using the machine to remove the bad stuff and then inject back the, uh, some of the stimulation factors and hoping to make his patient uh, become younger. In the early stage of his practice, he used his uh, fresh frozen plasma as a replacement fluid, but there were so much allergic reactions and he slowly and changed to using a 5% albumin and the, the IVIG intravenous immunoglobin as the supplement. And by doing this, he was able to reduce the allergic rate uh, to less than 3%. So this is pretty much uh, what they're still doing in the San Francisco, okay? A company called Griffos, who is the maker, one of the largest uh, supplier of the albumin, uh, uh, pick up the, this information and begin to apply their technology in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And they were able to perform a early phase three, uh, we call it 3A clinical trial on uh, um, early and the middle stage uh, Alzheimer patients. And the results were published in 2000, uh, two years ago, one and a half years ago. Uh, no, it's two years ago now. So what they see is that by doing uh, TPE, uh, therapeutic uh, plasma exchange, you can decrease, decrease the uh, rate of uh, deterioration of uh, Alzheimer patient, which is a control group by 70%. So the treated, uh, this is the MMSE score. That is a score to measure the uh, severity of the Alzheimer patients. So you know that the treatment group will go, uh, go was slowly uh, get worse, okay? But the patient with without uh, treatment is going to get worse uh, much faster. Uh, so the, the, this result is uh, very uh, striking uh, to the uh, uh, anti-aging, medical field. In fact, uh, because of these uh, dramatic results, the Griffos was able to team up with uh, uh, a uh, neurological clinical ACE, ACE Alzheimer's Center. So in Barcelona uh, of Spain, they begin to set up plasma exchange centers uh, for the treatment uh, or uh, for the uh, control of uh, uh, early and uh, mid-stage Alzheimer's disease. And in the um, Berkeley group, they also begin to using the same protocol to uh, in a serial, uh, to decrease the uh, CRP, C-reactive protein of uh, old people uh, using serial uh, plasma exchange, okay? So these uh, are the same thing for other different terminology for the same thing. So in the literature, if you see uh, plasma phoresis, the plasma exchange, or DAPP, double filtration plasma uh, phoresis, or plasma dilution. These are all addressing uh, the similar process uh, for the uh, uh, aging problem. And some people may be wondering, uh, maybe this is just due to the argument. And the author of the uh, uh, original paper on, uh, on the opera is toxic. And she was able to do the experiment. And what she observed is that if you took, a, if you uh, excluded the albumin, there were no dramatic change in the effect. In other words, that he, she doesn't think that the effect of the um, uh, of the plasma phoresis with replacement fluid is uh, anything to do with the albumin. 
So with that given uh, as the background of the hydroponic pyrolysis, I begin to tell you our story about, uh, about applying hydroponic pyrolysis to develop an effective anti-aging and uh, a program for clinics. So like what I say, I was be begin to involve in uh, anti-aging and, and regenerative medicine back in the early on 1990s. And after that, I came back to Asia and began my practice in uh, Taipei. And I was doing a lot of uh, facial surgeries. In 2016, uh, because of, uh, uh, no, in 2012, I was uh, participate in a competition for a product uh, in the Beijing of China. And at that time, I was bring to the attention of the hydroconic pyrobiotic uh, experiment result. So, but I didn't do much, much about it until uh, 2016, okay? As that was the time when the Ambrosia uh, Stanford uh, entrepreneur, Jesse Cummins, began to do the uh, blood, transfusion of the college student into the old people. So what happened in 2016 was, uh, was a trip, uh, a surprise trip uh, to the uh, Cambodia, to, to the capital of uh, Cambodia, uh, Phnom Penh. At that time, an old friend of mine uh, lived in uh, Cambodia and he asked me, because he has a, a friend uh, who is a journalist there, and has some uh, neck problem. And he asked me to go to Cambodia and to, 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 uh, die, to treat him, okay? So I flew over there and the met the general and the, uh, this is the first time I was there. And, the, and what, what surprises me is they give me the following information. And that is because the, uh, the uh, Rook uh, Kumail, they are the Cambodian is is actually the young one of the youngest uh, population uh, has one of the youngest population in the world because all the a lot of old people was killed uh, during the uh, the uh, Kumail age and the because of that and there are so many young people and you can see so many kids running around on the street and what really attract our attention is that I saw about uh, a, a family of six and riding a, a, a bicycle, okay, a, a motorcycle like that, seems as like that. So, and after the, the motorcycle, I see a kid and he was riding a, a, a motorcycle. And I asked my friend, I said, wow, uh, is that any regulation about riding a any age limit about riding a motorcycle in Cambodia? And he, the answer is in Cambodia, if you can get on a motorcycle, then you, you, can, you can do it. Basically there's no restriction, no age restrictions. And at that time, an idea come to me and I begin to ask them, I say, so is there a restriction about drawing uh, blood from the uh, kids? And he, the answer is no, basically the, the answer is the same. What he says that if you can get blood, then there's no age restrictions. So our idea based on that was, was following the Jesse Commons in concept. You know, was that we are, because originally we are thinking about using the teenagers in Cambodia and we want to buy blood from them and using the blood to make a, a, a young a fresh frozen plasma for the injection. But as I mentioned, that was uh, 2016, and we begin to prepare to set up a blood transfusion clinic in uh, in in uh, Phnom Penh. But during that time, the uh, convoy's uh, landmark paper uh, published, and that's what I say. The convoy uh, proves that the old blood is toxic, and because of their paper, we begin to. We decided to using to combine the uh, therapeutic plasma forensis and with the fresh frozen plasma of the teenager, and that was our original business plan. That was to set up a clinic, which will let the client do the go through the plasma exchange, and after that we we replace the uh, plasma with uh, FAP of uh, teenagers. And what happened is that. Uh, 
Uh, we try to do this and try to market this product. However, the, the response was uh, um, actually very poor. And the reason is most of the people got very interested in, in the idea. But when they ask us where is the uh, plasma coming from, and they begin to understand it's actually coming from uh, Cambodia, and they got very hesitant about it because uh, Cambodia has lots of uh, AIDS and it has a lot of uh, uh, other uh, SAD, sexually transmitted disease. So very few, it's actually there are very, very few people uh, finally accept the concept. In the same time, most of the uh, patient, our patients in, uh, in Taiwan and Malaysia, and the blood vessel is so small and we also have a problem using a TPE machine and to do the uh, plasma forest on them because this usually require a 17 gauge needle. So with this uh, poor marketing market response, we are forced to, to implement our treatment. So what we are trying to do is, uh, is using the bloodletting, which is it's, it's just like donating of blood. Uh, which is legal and people are not getting frightened by the big needle about uh, bloodletting. At the same time, we begin to use uh, artificial, artificial plasma replacement fluid and, and, and combine with some hormone and the cytokines and to make a bag of fluid and, to, and use it in combination with the uh, bloodletting. So what we do is that we, get, we will take out 100 50 cc of uh, whole blood and replace it with some of the uh, the, the artificial uh, uh, plasma. So at that time, another group of uh, doctors in uh, Stanford, they published a uh, very important paper about the, how to uh, make the plasma younger. So what they say is that there are four types of factors in the plasma. And most of them are common factors. That means that the concentration of those factors in the young age and the old age is the same. And there are uh, adolescent factors. That means the, these factors has the maximum concentration at the age of, uh, say like 15, 16. And there are beneficial factors. And that are the factors which is, uh, goes, uh, uh, slowly decreases with age. And finally, there are harmful factors that are the uh, factors uh, gradually accumulate uh, through our life and uh, become uh, saturated uh, at the age of say like uh, 40 or 50s. And they classify the factors into four different categories in, in the plasma. So with those concepts, so what we are trying to do is that using all those informations and my background in chemistry, so we try to take out some, a bunch of, say like 150 cc of blood out of a patient each time and replace it with 150 cc of, uh, of, of different plasmas. And we call it uh, intermittent plasma conditioning. So in the early stage of our uh, program, and we, are, have, we run into uh, some problems. And one is the allergy problems. So they orig early, in the early stage, our formula will, in, will induce about 30%. Uh, one third of the patients will have some allergic rea reactions. And the other one is uh, cytokine storms. We will say about five, five to 10% of, uh, the, of the patients because they are not clear guidelines for the dosage for the cytokines. And sometimes, uh, they might uh, run into cytokine storms. That's, that's going to a low blood pressure. And this is quite frightening experiments. And at that time, and thanks to the advance of the proteotome analysis. So this is the Stanford group. They're using um, uh, a new technology to analyze uh, about um, 7,000 proteins in 3,000 subjects. So they are able to identify uh, a, a lot of proteins which are in relationship with, with the aging. And because uh, we because their work uh, is, uh, is sponsored by the, uh, by the US government 
and their result is available online, we begin to tap into their database. And eventually we identify about uh, 10 different, uh, different uh, me medication or different substance that is related uh, to the age. And we begin to uh, fine tune the formula, the, com uh, the composition of, of these uh, substances. And final, finally, we are able to come up with a, a composite uh, IV solution, uh, which is uh, has a low allergic rate and the high response rate. So this was uh, from uh, the QC third quarter of uh, 2018. And since then, because the, the procedure was has very high level percentage of reception. So we were able to do over 1000 sections uh, very quickly within one and a half years. And, but at that time, people uh, begin to come back to us. But when people come back to us for two or third time, second or third time, and they begin to ask us that, uh, do you have any laboratory uh, data on our improvement and things like that? So we are forced you know, to, be, to develop a diagnostic method, uh, which to, to explain the progress of the plasma conditioning. So what we do now is this, we'll take our patient's plasma 100%, okay? We take patient's blood into the lab and the separate the plasma, and we will give it to a certain amount of the uh, stem cells. Uh, we'll use them to culture them. And then observe the residual number of the stem cells within a week. So we, what we see is that most of the patient, most of the patient, the, the plasma can, the survival rate of the stem cells in the plasma is less than 1%, okay? And this is very important information. And we didn't expect it. Uh, we are not expecting this type of result because people like us, you know, we were doing uh, cell transplant, stem cell infusions. We thought the, we, we know the um, survival rate probably is not that high or the retention rate is not that high, but we didn't expect the, the survival rate to be so low, which is less than 1%. And, what we are trying to do, and I think is uh, very unique, is that we go one step further. That is, we begin to use some medic me medicine as a control, and we begin to tune the uh, different proportion. So in other words, that we come up with a formula which can improve the survival rate of the stem cells in the plasma, okay, by uh, hundreds of times, okay? This is the type of uh, uh, diagnostic tool we have now. So this is the same patient. And after two or three uh, plasma uh, conditioning sessions of uh, 150 cc, and you can see that in about uh, one month, uh, you can see the uh, very significant change in the survival rate of the stem cells in different type of, of composition of the plasma. So with this uh, tool, we begin to uh, get into uh, la larger uh, clinical uh, trials. So you can see that the same patient, this is the survival rate curve, and you will, you will gradually improve with time, okay? And at the end of the treatment, you can see that the survival rate of the original plasma is already improved by uh, uh, 100 times. So how long will this uh, improvement chain uh, uh, last? So you can, uh, in this graph, you can see that after the second two session, the, the patient, uh, the result of the patient can last for about uh, almost three months, almost three months, okay? And this is more data on this. And if you are interested in uh, knowing more of the result, uh, more of the, our uh, diagnostic method, then we can uh, we we need we can spend another talk and for this uh, special topics. So the result is that uh, if this is the original survival rate of the stem cell in the patient, and with five treatment, you can see that the survival rate of the stem cell in the patient's plasma 
was increased by 120 times. And this is a, a, a very shocking um, experimental result or, or clinical result. And the patient will also come back to us, they begin to tell us that uh, his uh, grandchildren begin to tell him that he's begin to grow uh, dark hair. And they think this is a very interesting phenomenon. And the patient is uh, uh, 95 years old. Okay, it's a 95 years old Asian man, okay. So we continue uh, in the hoping to optimize our treatment and trying to implement our treatment protocol and make it uh, more safe and safer and uh, more effective. So we, what we do now, we begin to uh, considering the patient's body weight and the, the volume of the uh, fluid in the uh, various uh, compartment in the body. So in order to fine tuning the uh, compositions of the plasma, then we need to do some calculations and the and, and another reason we need to do that is because since we have to take a 100 and 150 cc of the blood, so some patients, especially for the very old uh, age group, uh, they might run into anemia. So as a result, we need to uh, study the half-life of this treatment. So by uh, continue following some of the patients, and we are able to come up with a graph like this, so, and you can see the patients after four sessions, the, the survival rate of the stem cell become uh, improved 120 times. And uh, about uh, five months later, then we can do another experiment, similar experiment on the same patient. And you can see the improvement of the stem cell survival rate uh, will continue, will drop by only 50%, okay? So what we are seeing then, this is the new, the, the most recent data and the same patient, we are following him for even longer. So basically we are able to using our formula to tune the survival rate of the stem cells uh, to tune the, in his plasma, okay? So what we are seeing, what we are saying is, is some is like this. So what you need, need to see is the, so this is the survival rate of the stem cell in the plasma originally. And this is the stem, survival rate of the stem cell after the treatment, okay? So this is a 40 times difference of the survival rate. So, and this is the, uh, the goal of the treatment because if we do everything right, by the end of the day, we should be able to increase the uh, survival rate of the stem cell in the plasma by another four, 400 times. So we give a summary, uh, a short summary right, right now. So but what, basically what we find is that uh, the old plasma, which is toxic, and in our experiment is uh, very uh, clearly shows that the stem cell, okay, cannot survive, cannot be supported using an old plasma. And this plasma can be improved in three to six uh, plasma conditioning sessions. And the, the result of the conditioning can be, can be kept for about several months. So this is basically what we see. And uh, with this uh, information, we are able to uh, fine tune our intermittent plasma conditioning program and the, we, using a biochemical or pharmacological uh, 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 recipe or formula formulations. So basically, what we just show you is is something like this. So basically, you have a patient like this, and he took one hundred and fifty cc of blood and give it. We separate the the plasma, his plasma, and give it to hundred stem cells. So in the beginning, after seven days, there are only three stem cells left. And if you do some plasma session. A uh, couple of plasma session. Uh, each each time you will give, infuse 150 cc of the uh, replacement fluid. Okay. So then two months later, you took out the same patient's plasma and to the lab and give the give it to the same stem cell. And seven days later, you can see that the stem cells will begin to grow to 360. So from three to 360, that is uh, 120 times improvement. 
And if you don't do nothing, then six months later, you do the same experiment on the patient. You took out his plasma and, and, and give it to 100 stem cells again. Then you will have 180 stem cells survive after seven days. So this is uh, basically what we can uh, show, what we are showing now. So as many of you, you are physicians, so you must be aware that most of the medications, the half-life is very, very short. So basically that reason we need to take medications say like uh, once a day or once a week to the best of my knowledge is GLP-1 injection, that's about it. But what, is there are very, very little uh, medicines or that can last for months. So we, what we think is that our formulation is acting pretty much like a vaccine for aging. Okay. So we also address the same question, is this due to albumin, just like uh, Dr. Camboy in Berkeley? So what we do is that we, we bring the albumin to the lab and give it to the stem cells, and there are zero survival rate. And the, you need to, uh, basically what we are saying is that the, there is uh, no reason the, the, none of the stem cells will survive in the albumin, okay? So this experiment proves that the result is not due to the albumin, uh, which is in the, the albumin is actually toxic uh, to the stem cell alone. So in summary, so we, what we have shown you is the plasma is essential to the survival of stem cells. And the good plasma is, is essential to longevity. And the reason we come up with this, uh, this uh, statement is very interesting. Originally, we thought the older people, the plasma is worse because the older the, the plasma, the, there should be less uh, useful substance and the more uh, old, old uh, aging substance. But our data now begin to show that for those people who are over age of 80 or 90, their plasma, although the activity is not good in the beginning, but their plasma actually responds much better uh, as compared to, uh, to our treatment as compared to the uh, younger counterparts. In other words, uh, we find that for those people who live to old age, that, is, that means that let's say like uh, more than 85 years old, their plasma uh, can be adjusted or, they, or we can say the, their plasma, uh, co the condition of their plasma is more malleable as compared to those, the, the other part, which is uh, the patients who is young age, but who had a stroke or, or something like that. So our treatment now is, uh, we, we separate it to two phases. One is the intense phase, the other one is the maintenance phase. So intense phase is that we did it uh, once every other week for three times. And for the maintenance phase, we can do it every three to six months, okay? And it depends on the individual uh, analysis or we, we, have, we sometimes have to give them some uh, supplementation for the cytokines. And here are some uh, uh, case studies. And one is uh, a patient, a friend of mine, and he has a, a big company in, in uh, China. And he came to us actually three years ago, and he did a, uh, one uh, plasma uh, diagnostic uh, studies. And you can see that the his plasma is actually very poor, responds very poor. The, and what's interesting is that uh, his uh, serological exam, basically all the routine blood tests are all normal. So when I see this uh, very poor re result, I call him up and he, call, he answered me and he said, well, how do you know I, ju I just had a stroke, okay? So you know what I'm trying to say is that for people like him, you know, who don't drink, no smoke, and do exercise every day. And he did a physical examination uh, every year and everything's normal, but he had a stroke. And we can, our plasma diagnostic ex experiment clearly shows that because his plasma cannot support his stem cell to survive. Now, this is a, a very good example. And he began our plasma conditioning therapy for about 10 to 20 sessions. And he's now able to 
back to play uh, tennis. Okay. And then this is a video from uh, last year. And now he's he, he just came to us a couple of weeks ago. He was saying that he's doing even better now, okay, in on the tennis court. And then the other patient is a patient who is uh, has a diabetic chronic uh, kidney disease. Basically, and we, we did the same thing, the same type of plasma diagnostic studies. Then you can, and he, she, she began to get some treatment. Say so after seven sessions, and his, uh, her EGFR was increased by about 20%, okay? So we, we see this type of result on chronic kidney disease uh, quite often in our clinic, okay? And the other type of people who will come to us are usually those, uh, uh, their son or daughter, uh, came to us because their parents become uh, very, very old. We, we call it, uh, call it the frailty or sarcopenia type of patients. And these type of patients, originally we thought their performance, the, the survival rate is very low. But actually, these are the, the response to uh, our plasma conditioning therapy very well because with a few sessions, usually they can improve their uh, stem cell survival rate uh, very quickly as compared to the younger parts. And you can see that this is a photo from for her hair. And this is the from the dye. And this is her hair. And this, you can see the new hair growing out of her scalp are uh, uh, dark in color. Okay. And there are so many other cases, including uh, like the presbyopia improvement, the menstruation comes again and uh, and post-surgical recovery. Alzheimer patients, and some of them who is like a, this patient who is a 90 years old, has a pancreatic cancer and also a DKA. And he was put into a hospice and the, his uh, son come to us and he, he said he wanted to try our plasma therapy. So we give him some uh, uh, plasma and he, he bring it to the hospice and infuse to his father and his father was able to recover quickly and uh, eventually got out of the hospital and, and lived to another uh, almost two, two more years. And this gentleman, his son, is our representative in uh, Phnom Penh, uh, become our representative in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. So, so what, what I want to tell you is that uh, the, this heterochronic parabolic type of plasma exchange uh, therapy is originally an ex experimental method for studying the aging, okay? But now we keep on implementing these type of things. And then we, there are probably four ways you can apply the, this uh, heterochronic parabolic uh, principle in the anti-aging medicine. So the first way you do it, you can do that is, is, is the natural way. It means that you can remove the aging substance by menstruations and uh, you can get the useful substance by getting pregnant. The other one is we call it biological way. You can do the bloodletting and the infuse it, young blood into the patient, into the body. That we, this is called the ambrosial way. Now, the third way is using a plasma phoresis machine to wash out the toxic substance and uh, replace it with uh, artificial plasma fluid. And what we are doing is that we are using a combination of uh, biochemicals and which will remove the uh, toxic substance and uh, uh, and uh, increase the eight, uh, useful substance in the one part therapy. And there are different advantages, and we, we are not going to talk about the um, the natural way. Then you need to get pregnant, but eventually it's pretty expensive. And for the biological treatment, then the supply of the young blood is very limited, and uh, there always there is always risk for contacting uh, transmit, uh, infectious disease. And the, the physical way means that using the machine uh, combined with artificial uh, plas re plasma replacement. Then this type of treatment, you need, you need to have a large vessel and uh, the, the patient's uh, willingness of accepting this type of treatment is, uh, is more limited. And our method, the advantage is, is, is very minor procedure. So most of the patient can tolerate this type of concept. And the cons are, because this requires multiple sessions, you, you, you cannot do the, the therapy in one day, you need to come back here. 
to do it uh, say like six to three to six times and the results are progressive okay so and some of because most of you are doctors so you will begin to ask me is there any clinical trial results and there are different clinical trial results uh, related to the heterochronic parabolic type of uh, therapy and the most famous one is what i talked to you about is the ambrosia uh, is, is a result called AMBAR, A -M -B -A -R, study on Alzheimer disease. And the result shows that 70% uh, decrease in the rate of uh, worsening of uh, mild to moderate disease uh, of Alzheimer, Alzheimer patients. Okay. And there are also some results showing that similar results like ours, that the, for those people who are getting the, uh, this type of therapy, can have an uh, improvement in the renal function by 10 to 15%. And these are the immunological data. You can see that this, is, this type of data are famous because, uh, because uh, this type of data are famous because of the COVID-19. So a lot of uh, people become uh, interested in using uh, hydroconic probiotic data uh, type of treatment for, for treating the COVID-19 uh, long COVID-19 syndromes. And this is, the I think the most important study is this one, uh, which I talked to you about already, because this is the uh, uh, anthropological type of data. And that tells you uh, the old, if you can get pregnant at an old age, then you are going to get very good uh, improve, in, very good improvement in the rate of uh, living to an old age. And the clinical effect of this type of therapy are as follows, that in people get various results. So they get a better uh, virility and they, immune, they, they, they don't get cold much easier. And if they get COVID-19, some of them recover very quick. And the, their improvement in the cognitive function and kidney function and things like that, okay? And there are many other possible applications of the uh, this type of technique, and you can use it for eventually for the stroke and for the uh, heart disease and for diabetes and things like that. And there are also uh, people begin to using this type of uh, therapy into different uh, uh, clinical trials, okay? So, so we're coming to the uh, last part of the talk. And for most of doctors, you are going to ask me is now, how do I use this type of uh, uh, program in our practice? So it's the positioning of this type of program, I think uh, there are two ways you can look at this type of program. The first way of looking at this or using this type of uh, therapy is you can use it as an independent therapy for resident stem cell activation. In other words, uh, because of uh, the condition of the patient's plasma, become better. So the resident stem cell in their vital organ, like in the heart or in the lung or in the kidney will become more uh, active, more active. So in other words, that because of their resident stem cell were activated, so the, the function of the organ will begin to improve. This is one type. Uh, that, but for another type of application, is that for those people who are doing the cell transplant or stem cell therapy or doing immunocell therapy, things like that. Because our data shows that the survival rate of these uh, cells cultivated in the laboratory is so low in the old plasma. So I think it would be very wise for those doctors to, uh, to give their patient uh, or this type of plasma conditioning therapy, okay, to improve the survival rate of the transplanted cells into their body. So in other words, you will get much better results with the same amount of, or even less amount of the number of cells. So with this uh, technique, you can find, we are diagnostic technique, you can find the time, what's the best time for infuse the uh, cells into the body for the, uh, cell therapy, therapy uh, doctors. So what we are doing now is uh, we're trying to using the technology uh, and uh, expand it into different type of cell lines. 
and we are begin to adding more and more uh, 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 chemical substance into the formulation and, and hoping to uh, get better results. And in terms of uh, expansion, we are setting up uh, different uh, laboratories in the different cities in Southeast Asia and China. Uh, and we are also welcoming people who we want to set up a joint venture clinic with us. Uh, so this is the roadmap. And you can see Kuala Lumpur is right here, Singapore, Jakarta, uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Phnom Penh, and Bangkok. And these are the cities in China. And this is uh, what our company uh, hoping to expand it into uh, after the COVID-19. Uh, and because I think most of you are aware of that this is not a very simple type of uh, treatment because each time for the treatment, each time you need to uh, take out the blood of the patient and send it to our laboratory. And our lab will do some experimental studies on the patients and we will have a report and send back to you in about a week. And you can try to tune or uh, fine tune the plasma of the patient by yourself. And, but I think it's quite complicated because you need to do uh, a lot of uh, chemistry, chemistry, chemical like of calculations. Then, or you can ask our uh, 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 representative agents uh, to give you our formulations. So we are developing some automated machine uh, which can compound the uh, fluid for the uh, plasma conditioning. So the, what we think in the future, what the, business, the clinical model will be like this. That is, uh, you, the clinician will take out some blood from the patient and give it to our uh, diagnostic robot. Then the, the robot will then send the formula to a compounding robot and the compounding robot will, will compound the a fluid uh, and give it, you can give it back to the patients. And this is the, the model, okay? So the take home message is as follows. One, stem cell dysfunction causes aging. Two, the old plasma is key to stem cell dysfunction. And this is uh, proven by the Arena Combo in 2016. And what we are trying to show is Old plasma can be improved by intermittent plasma conditioning. So we can use a simple IV catheter to improve the uh, survival rate of the stem cells in the patient's plasma by like 40, 50 times you know, with a simple IV catheter. And the, the improvement can last it for about say like up to six months. And for all of you who are interested, and I think maybe uh, you want to know more about this, then it's an English book already been published uh, about this uh, heterochronic paraboys, uh, we call it anti-aging plasma exchange. And this is published uh, this year in February. Okay. And there are one more things I want to tell you, and this is to honor Steve Jobs, the late Steve Jobs. So I think, there's a Twitch right here. And I think this is probably the most exciting talk about this. And I hope you, all of you can bear with us on this. Because the transplant surgery is getting very mature, but the, there is always a shortage of the uh, organ donation. So there's a technique called, we call it uh, ex vivo organ repair, things like that. So based the idea is that you take out the organ of an injured human lung, which is not suitable for being transplanted. Now you use the same concept as uh, Alexis Carroll's transbiosis. You connect it uh, to a, a healthy uh, swine and things like that. So with this type of experiment, you can increase the number of organ that can be transplanted, okay, uh, in the transplant surgery. So this is the uh, reserve we, you can see this published by uh, a team from Colombia. So you can see this uh, already damaged lung and after 36 hours of uh, cross circulation with the swine, you can see a very significant improvement on this. So with this concept, with this concept and our uh, clinical uh, experience, about two years ago and the 
our chairman begin to ask us to look into uh, to implement our treatment, the our, uh, plastic plasma conditioning treatment for a more for a specific organ. And what we got interested is improve the function of a kidney. Okay. So what we do, we need to do a couple of things. One, we need to set up an animal model. Okay, and this animal model allows us to do intermittent uh, plasma exchange. Okay, very in the in in the lab, uh, very uh, simple. Okay, and the the other things that we need to come up with new and stronger formulation because we think you want to reverse an age a, a damaged organ, then you need something stronger. Okay, and we and with that being developed, we begin to do some of the plasma exchange experiment in the laboratory, okay? And here are, are the, the latest result. So we are using the uh, ischemia uh, renal models on a rat, okay? And this is the, the, the kidney of a, a rat being uh, clamped uh, for one hour or longer. And this is the result. This is the normal kidney. This is the ischemic kidney six days later. Uh, after, is a ischemic kidney uh, for 60 minutes and seven days later, this is the appearance of the damaged kidney. And this is the kidney which has four treatment. And this is the kidney has 10 treatment using our plasma conditioning uh, technology. And you can see the treated uh, kidney is almost normal okay and these are the histological data this is the the histology of the uh, damaged kidney you can see the atrophy of the glomerular and with without the um with our treatment you can see the uh, glomerular become a uh, normal okay so with with that i'll come to the conclusion of our of my talk and thank you for your time and the interest in our technology. I will take uh, some questions if you want. Thank you, Dr. Peng. Yeah. Now yeah, the Q&A session is open for, for everyone. Anyone, anyone that who would like to raise a question, please uh, unmute your own, own mic and uh, please be patient and uh, take turns to raise the questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Peng. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I'm Dr. Amnudin from Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I've read your book. Very interesting. Oh. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering in terms of your, uh, in terms of your priming of the patient, do you look into other parameters as to the toxicity, the hormonal status? Is there a standard preparation before that? Yeah. Basically, we, in our lab, we need to test a lot of things, you know, because but, but we don't do the, what we do is that we do, we take out, we need the plasma of the patients come to us. Then we do some uh, standard serological tests as well, okay? And yeah. then, but the most important one is that we need to take the plasma and the, and the, go, go to the lab and to give, to give it to our cell lines and to culture them. And, and, and we also give some different medical compo uh, pharmacological compositions and to try to increase the, uh, the survival rate of the stem cell. This is the, the, the core technology of our, our method. I, I, I heard that you have got your company in Penang, uh, but logistically, yes. logistically, is it possible to do it here with the time frame and uh, uh, frequent uh, sending of uh, blood plasma to your lab. Okay, the the, the question is this. Okay, what we are do, because our lab uh, was uh, was based in Taipei right now. Okay, and the the reason I'm giving this talk is because our uh, represent our, our representation is uh, Mr. Lu in uh, yes. Malaysia, and we are actually training some uh, technicians from uh, Malaysia in Taipei right now. So right. we are hoping to set up a lab in KL uh, at the end of this year. Right, right. Okay, yeah, but yes. not Penang yet, yeah. Okay, okay. So we'll be looking forward to uh, uh, future development in KL. 
But yes. uh, are you looking for multi-center study a study trial uh, to recruit some patients from Malaysia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can do that. Yeah, I, I always work on all, all type of uh, collaboration, like including clinical trial. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you, if then, you if you want to do if you are if you know I, I don't know about the regulations and since that of the IRB since that in uh, Malaysia, but yeah. you, if you are able to have some type of resource regarding those, you know, please let us know. Yeah. Yeah, we are very strict, but uh, we can uh, we can uh, recruit a few interested researchers and lies with the university oh, or good. whatever. You know, very good. Uh, very why good. not? We yeah. can explore. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Amin. Doctor? Yes. May I have two questions? Mm -hmm. I'm Fidia from Jakarta. Mm -hmm. Yes, Doctor, uh, you mentioned about the preconditioning for stem cell to survive. Mm -hmm. Say that again. I'm sorry. Well, maybe she will reconnect later. Uh, next question, anyone? Hello? Yes, yeah. please. Okay, you're online. Hello? Yes. Uh, do you hear me, doctor? I just yeah, want I can to hear you now. You. Now, okay, yeah. Yeah, I just want to ask you, uh, you mentioned about the preconditioning for stem cell to survive for the uh, that you treat treat the patient for the intermittent plasma conditioning. What did you do for the preconditioning for this that treatment? Well, basically, we, that's what I show you. We have a, a special technical platform. You, you can, we will take patient's plasma and mix it with different type of uh, um, medications. And with the mix, mixture, we'll come up with the best formula for, for stem cell survival. And that's the, the formula. And then you can use that formula and uh, translate into uh, a, a pharmacological dosage. Oh, I see. I thought you uh, prepare the patient before you do the intermittent plasma conditioning. No, no, no. We do the intermittent plasma conditioning for before patient get the cell therapy. Oh, okay. And yeah. another question, uh, doctor. Uh, do you ever uh, try to uh, which one the treatment for the now uh, there are so many famous for the umbilical uh, cord for the stem cell mm. did yeah. you compare that with the result with your technique uh, oh, yeah. with the stem cell for the umbilical which one is more no i i, I... I used to talk about the cell therapy. We do cell therapy for almost 20 years. And I think the for the, the stem cell transfusion before this technique, uh, I would say at the best, you know, you are, you know, the return rate of the patients is very low, probably 3%, 5%. But we are technique. The re retention rate of the patient is probably 60%. So patient feel the difference about this. And the, after the plasma conditioning, when we, we infuse the stem cell, then we only need probably one tenth or one twenty twentieth of the original dosage. And the people, patient already can feel the effect. Oh, I see. Hmm. Okay, thank you, doctor. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, any next question, any doctors? Okay, uh, Dr. Pen, I would like to revert a question from Dr. Ng. Uh, who can be young donor? Any inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria? As a young donor, we don't need a young donor now. Yeah, because you can do, we can do it. I mean, you, if you have a young donor, say like a 15 years old, younger than 15 years old, probably is the right age. But what we are trying to do is trying to do it without the donor. We're trying to come up with a pharmacological uh, uh, type of uh, uh, solution to replace the actual donor. Okay, I hope that answered answer the question of uh, Dr. Ng. 
And uh, Dr. Sim would like to ask, uh, is there anyone with retina detachment tried the treatment? Oh, I, I don't have anybody with retinal detachment. Yeah. But I do have some people who has like, you know, presbyopia since as I, they have good results on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. And, uh, Dr. P is uh, asking, what's the common side effect post-procedure? Any allergic reaction? Yeah, the allergic reaction with our new formulation is probably less than one, less than one percent now. Thank you, Dr. Pen. Uh, for those doctors are still online, do you like to ask any question, please? Hi, Dr. Pen. It's Alice yes. here. Hey, Alice. How are you? I'm cool. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Now, just, just to reply the uh, answer for Dr. Sim, who asked about retinal detachment. Now, retinal detachment is a mechanical problem. That means the, the layers of the retina is detached. So I don't think any uh, medication as such will actually improve because you need to surgically reattach the retina for, for you know, regaining the function. So, I mean, just to also further on that is, you know, any of this plasma uh, exchange, you know, will probably, you know, improve any physiological aging changes such as presbyopia or perhaps glaucoma, any age-related problems. But for retinal detachment, I don't, I don't think that would help. No, but, just, just a feedback. But, but Alice, I think you know, yep. you've been, been giving some, you just, you know, inspire me on this. Because if you do retinal detachment, it's a surgical procedure, right? So the, our plasma condition can accelerate the recovery. So this, yeah. I'm Pro sure about that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, probably accelerate the recovery, but you know, the treatment itself may not be able to help the ret retina yes. to attach by itself, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Mm. Can I just you, ask, uh, since you got our eye expert here, is there any work on retinitis pigmentosa? I've got two patients, you know, exploring many things to improve retinitis pigmentosa. You, Alice, do you know that? Any idea? I, I think retinitis pigmentosa is a genetic problem. Uh, unless we are able to alter the genetics, but I, I don't think at this point in time with plasma, uh, I don't think we have done anything to alter the genetics as yet, unfortunately. No. Now, there have been a lot of experiments doing Im implantation of rods and cones into the retina. And I think the, the research is still ongoing for those kind of genetic problems where the problem is in the cell, you know, it's a cellular problem. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think right now it's by implanting some of the rods and cones to replace the, the defect the defect uh rots and cones uh, probably that's the only way that i can think of at this point yeah yeah thank you five years ago there was some work uh, with the stem cell injected into the retina it's uh, work done in the philippines and uh, since then it's gone quiet i, I didn't know the result but anyway thank you very much any next uh, any other questions Otherwise, we are going to 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 hold and uh, to to off the, the the stage for for today. Uh, Jamin, there's another question in the chat. You can probably uh, address that. Yeah, Doctor Pen, uh, Johannes uh, from Jakarta is asking is asking what diseases can plasma exchange therapy help in? I mean, she is asking what therapy, uh, what treatment, what disease can uh, the plasma exchange the that, uh, treating. That's a good question because I think the all the disease related to uh, degeneration or aging are, are candidates for this type of therapy. And what, what we see the most is like a, a sarcopenia, fire T, chronic renal disease. Some of the people who has, has a lung, a COPD, lung, lung problems, and things like that. Yeah. And what about in terms of uh, preventive medicine or anti-aging medicine, Dr. Pan? Yeah, that's, 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 very, that's a given because th this one is give patient an overall improvement in their virility and things like that. And they feel, I, I, 
I, they feel, I, uh, in a sense, they feel cleaner, okay? And they feel more uh, energetic and things like that. Yeah. The re retention rate is very high because the, the response rate is, is quite good, yeah. And are there any uh, minimum dose? I would say you would need probably 900, 900, 300 cc probably is the minimum dose, yeah. Because 300 cc is about 10% of the, the plasma volume, yeah. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Peng. I hope that answered the question for Debbie. And uh, Johanna is asking again, uh, what stage, what stage can the, what stage of disease can be treated? That's quantity, no, I think the easy, easiest way you can address this type of question is like a chronic kidney disease. 3A, 3B, and 4, early 4, can be treat, can be controlled very well, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pran. Uh, yeah, uh, anyone else have a, have a question to ask Dr. Pan right now? I mean, this is a very good opportunity. Everyone is here, and we have uh, some experts from different fields as well. So I hope, I hope you guys have uh, asking uh, more questions. Okay, uh, I think that's it, Dr. Pen. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you uh, for attending and spending all your precious time with us in uh, this uh, beautiful Friday afternoon. We are going to close the stage uh, right now. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alice from uh, London <laughs> and a lot of doctors, I mean, others from, from Jakarta, Indonesia. I hope you have a pleasant uh, and a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Pen. Thank you, Mr. Bye, Bye, Peter. Bye. 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 Bye.